Hey everyone, welcome back to another This Old House Live q and I'm Chris Ermides, and I'm here with Ross Cherthui, our heating, our, sorry, our home technology expert, and Heath Eastman, our master electrician. Hey guys. How's it going? Good, good. So we're here to talk about uh, home technology and geofencing and smart home systems and installations. And before we get into that stuff in the Q and A, Ross, I gotta ask: Like, did you fall down the rabbit hole? <laughs> what is up that that door behind you? It's a uh, mini door, Chris. It's you a don't mini have a mini door, door in your house? Is that is that where you practice your uh, your dunking? Does this, this look weird? <laughs> <laughs> That's it amazing. Looks like that door would be twenty feet away. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah. It's very. It's very I love it. It's very oh. cool. Um, how are you guys doing? Stay busy. Good. Good. Yeah. No. Nope. Staying busy. Managing. Good. Um, well, Ross, I understand you wanted to chat a little bit about uh, geofencing, something that um, you know a lot about. I know. I learned about it 15 minutes ago when you just described it. So, uh, <laughs> you share with our audience what geofencing is and how sure. it works and what the benefits are? Yeah, so you know, I get a lot of questions about uh, geofencing and what it is and how to use it and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like it's probably a good um, good you know, application to, to give the background of. So geofencing is the equivalent of setting up a virtual boundary around a particular geographic area. So for example, if you were to pin your house and you set that as your geofencing location and you set up a radius around that house. So let's just say you set it a mile or five miles or 10 miles or even 500 feet, but you pick this virtual boundary uh, and basically with your phone attached to a smart home device and it knows the location, if you leave that boundary, you can get your house to do certain things. So you could basically say, all right, if I exceed and go outside of my 10 mile radius, I want to turn my lights off. I want to turn my thermostat into setback mode. I want to shut my water valve. I want to do you know anything I want to do to the house automatically. So it's, it's the equivalent of having a away mode for the house that does it automatically. And then this, uh, you know on the contrary, when you come in, you know you enter that radius or you enter that you know geolocation. When you do that, then you can have the house turn on. So you can go back into home mode. So the setback on your temperature, you know. So basically, if you have a thermostat like this. Uh, you can, you know, use this uh, to basically change your, your with geofencing. You can change the temperature automatically from where you are in the world. Um, so, so that is kind of the kind of an intro to geofencing. Now, a couple things to note. First off, is privacy, right, and security. So, your phone is tracking your location, and you're telling a third-party device where you are. So, that's some people have security issues or privacy issues, meaning that that they don't want that. So you're, there's a trade-off there between convenience and privacy or security, however you want to view it. Um, and on the second part of that is if you have a lot of people in your house and a lot of people coming and going, um, you, you either want to use that, set that radius really far, or you might not, geofencing, for example, might not be the best fit for you. Um, it is tied to your phone. So anybody that has a phone um, can, um, can be basically tagged and used as far as where they are in that boundary. Um, and I can go into more detail as far as it, there's a there's a couple apps like uh, Life 360 and IFTTT that allow you to track whole house, you know, so you can literally see what everyone's doing in your house. That's what I was wondering. So is it so the geofencing that you're talking about in, in the various systems, there are apps that connect them all. So you're not having to rely on just your, you know, uh, just your thermostat or just your lights or something else like you can go to one place and set the parameters for, and it'll talk to all those things from one place? Yeah, so it depends on what devices you're trying to connect to. So some of them allow you to directly connect with the device, right? In some cases, they don't allow that, but they might have IFTTT integration, right? That's if this, then that. And with that type of structure, there is one place, right? If everybody in your house goes outside of that radius, in that situation, put the house into away mode. Right. If everybody in your house comes inside that radius, or even the first person enters that radius, put the house back into home mode. And so uh, there's an app called Life 360, which is a way for a parent to basically track their child. And so you could literally have your whole family on this Life 360 app, 
and you could see where everyone in your family is at all times, as long as their mobile device is on and it's enabled. Uh, and from that, with IFTTT integration, you could say when the last person basically leaves that radius, leaves the geo, you know, the geo fence that you've set up, put the house into a way mode. And when the first person enters that, put the house into home mode, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Uh, it sounds very cool and a little bit, a little bit scary too. I mean, the privacy issues you brought up, are they, are, are, are any of these companies having running into issues with them, with those privacy issues? Not necessarily like, um, you know, all of them have their own privacy clauses that they don't share your personal data, you know, with third parties, uh, you know, advertisers and that stuff, but they do use your data in aggregate. So they basically, you know, will, will take away your, what they explain is that they take away your personal identifiers and you just, you're just a data pool, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, you have to weigh, every person's going to be different in terms of how they view this, you know, this, what I consider the privacy security is probably the biggest, uh, issue and hindrance in the smart home technology place, um, right now. And so, you know, there isn't, uh, there isn't like a regulatory body that says you have to do this, you have to do that. And it's, it's a person by person choice. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of convenience that you get by having this type of technology, right? it's all about convenience, right? You don't have to turn all your lights off. They go off automatically when you leave that radius, right? You don't have to shut your water valve off when you go on vacation. It does it automatically. Like, what I love about smart homes is that they work, you know, symbiotically with you so that, you know, it, so that you don't have to remember these things. They, it just does it automatically behind the scenes. That's really cool. That's a good point. Um... I have some other questions before we get to that. I wanted to ask Keith. Um, Keith, what's your role in in these technologies as a as an electrician? Sure. So one of the simpler versions that we do of this is doing the smart switches in the house uh, and tying them to a smart hub, uh, which will allow you to have access to this. So there are some fairly simple systems that can be homeowner installed that'll that'll let you do this. Uh, and fairly inexpensive. Um, mostly, what we're seeing it for is turning the lights on and off as you come and go, but the greater you, there's a greater use you can you can treat anything pretty much like a switch like an open or a closed contact so i mean the potential is kind of unlimited you could tell it to turn a radio system on or off you can tell it to turn the sprinklers you can tell it to do anything as long as it's just telling a switch to go on or off depending on your location or the location of that particular device that's a really good analogy that the and i mean it helps sort of pull it all together for me in my head just that mm -hmm. that that boundary is the switch because you're you know, it's based on your on your cell on your cell phone. I assume you have to have a smartphone, obviously, and it yeah. has to have certain apps, and it's all it's all going to talk together that way. Yeah. So once you enter that, it just tells the switch to open or close, essentially. Once you're in that space, or a series of switches, or you know, like a giant macro command that sends this giant chain of commands to do whatever you want it to do. Yeah. And Ross, are these things that people can, with the exception of some of the more complicated systems that you know, in like. Well, well, Heath, you mentioned that that homeowners could install um, some of these light switches. Is that? Yeah, yeah. So actually, Lutron has some simple stuff that in some of their smart hubs, or the geofencing is in there. You can actually go ahead and turn that on yourself uh, and set that up so that you're if you replace the outside light switches with the smart switches, they'll turn on when you come home or when you get close enough to whatever you set your distance. And all of that is connecting to your Wi-Fi in the house, and then right. the and then talking to your smartphone exactly. Smartphone. The and, one thing I don't know is if you want to not have it track a particular phone, and Ross, you might know this, is it possible to follow another device with a care? Like if you had an iPad, that way it's not following one particular person's phone. Could it set up that app to control from the iPad only and then follow the iPad, depending where it's at, would it care? No, so any you could think of it as that it can track any mobile device. So okay. if you have an iPad, if you have a smartphone, Android, so it has to be a smartphone, it has to be something that has a cellular chip in it. Yeah, but if it's an iPad or, or Android or iPhone or something like that that has a chip, you can basically sign it as either a person or uh, you know as as part of somebody. Meaning, that if you had a cell phone and an iPad, for example. So anything with a cell signal, whether it's a tablet, whether it's a phone, shouldn't matter. You can set any of those up. You got it. You got it. Yep. Yep. So it, it, uh, I do get some questions about accuracy, like mm -hmm. how accurate is geofencing. And I think it's it's helpful to shed some light that um, the geofencing depends on um, basically where you are in the country. So urban settings like 
you know, Boston, New York City, Philadelphia, Chicago, the major hubs, I think, of the of the country. If you're in one of those cities, your accuracy is, is greatly enhanced on the geofencing. They can get the, the range is about 300 to 600 feet. So I average about 500 foot accuracy. So you can think of it as like if you've ever pulled up a, a map on your phone and you have a blue dot for yourself or, you know, a pin for yourself where you think you are, it might not show you exactly where you are, but usually it's pretty, pretty darn accurate. Mm. You know, and that's using, it's, it's really proximity to cell towers. That's ultimately what's driving the accuracy. So in a rural setting where you have much more uh, space between cell towers, your accuracy is going to go down. Right, the triangulation of the you know three cell towers and figuring out where you are in that in that area, um, so the accuracy does go up from that. But in urban settings, it's about three hundred to five hundred feet, give or take. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty good. Um, <clears throat> do you have a? Um, you you mentioned that Life three hundred and sixty app. Um, were, were there other ones out there as well? Uh, there are a couple other ones out there. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to blank on names, um, okay. but uh, but yeah, there are a couple out there as well. And do do the devices that you get? Will they say right on the package that they have geofencing within it, or um, or they have the cap capability, or is it is it is it is it something you would add to another device? Like if you have an older light switch, smart light switch, is is something you can connect somehow to these to that app and then get that capability in that switch you know that if that's yeah so a lot of companies that have geofencing built in will have it in the box geofencing capable built in you know it's, it will label it will put that that will be labeled on the box but a lot of companies are getting away from doing it themselves and using ifttt or a third-party device and so what you want to it will say compatible with ifttt compatible with apple home kit compatible with smart things compatible with um, you know, uh, Alexa, Amazon's Alexa, compatible with Google Nest, right? It will tell you what platforms it's compatible with. And from there, you can try to figure it out. So my, you know, what I tell most people is I prefer, I, and I like IFTTT. It's a third-party integration device that basically works across platforms. So it doesn't matter if you're in the Amazon ecosystem or the, you know, at the Apple ecosystem or the Google system. Um, IFTT kind of collaborates with all of them. So I would always, you know, look for that IFTT compatible. If it is compatible, then you have geofencing built in inherently because you can use Life360 or a similar app with IFTT integration to give you that geofencing capability, even if it doesn't say geofencing on the box. Got it. And how long has this technology been, been around? How long has it been? Is, is it just now becoming more prominent and common or has it been, has it been around for quite a while? Well, you know, technically geofencing has been around for a long time, but, um, but it's really only been talked about, um, you know, over the last probably two to five years, mm -hmm. depending, you know, uh, at what level. Yeah. Yeah. So All right. It's interesting stuff. It's, uh, I'm, you're making me think I should change some lights in my house. Although right now, uh, we're not going anywhere, so I don't know that it's going to do me much good. But once um, the pandemic ends, then we yeah, don't once talk. Ends, it's, it's a good yeah. yeah. We'll definitely dive dive into it. Um, all right, should we get to some questions? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So um, this first one's for for you, Heath. It's uh, Dave on on Facebook. Thanks for joining us, Dave. Uh, Heath, what's your opinion on Wi-Fi circuit breakers? Um, wonder if you could talk about those. I haven't actually installed any of those yet, so I think Leviton uh, makes some of those in the, the newer Leviton panels. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen a couple of the projects have had those white uh, electrical panels uh, from Leviton. I think the circuit breakers are now just coming out that they're Wi-Fi enabled so you can get the information off of them. I haven't used it. I haven't tried it. Uh, I, I can't wait to uh, and to see how they actually operate. Last panel we put in, they weren't quite available yet. Um, so I'm assuming the availability is probably there or really close. but. I, I haven't tried it. I'd love some feedback if anyone has. If anyone has any information on it, and see what they like or don't like about it. Ross, do you have uh, any experience with those? There's been a couple houses that have had them, um, and the feedback's all been positive so far. Um, and uh, so Leviton, I think, is the, the main brand that came out with it first. I think there, uh, there's some others that have followed suit. Siemens, I think, has their own brand now. Um, and there's a couple others, I think. But um, That's the Builder Show, I think. 
I see them in yeah, you see them in all the trade shows. Yeah. yeah. The IBS. What, is it, what are you getting out of them? Like, what's the what what is the value of having a Wi-Fi enabled circuit breaker? What's it what's it doing for you? So when it's yeah, actually, if you go. I was going to say, from what we've seen, I don't know that you can do a remote reset on or off. I don't believe. I think it's more just a status indicator, just to tell you what state it's in. Mm -hmm. Are you yeah. getting load capacities and like seeing how much amps that circuit's drawing and like that level of information, being able to monitor your electricity use through it, or is it just simple knowing if it's working or not? So if, you, if you're familiar with Sense, you know Sense, that electrical device, it's got two CT clamps that measures the power on L1 and L2, like the two hots coming in your panel. Yep. This, this type of technology is taking that, but it's applying it to a circuit breaker by circuit breaker um, arrangement. So you're measuring power on every single circuit going outbound, uh, and you're measuring voltage and you're measuring amperage, right? And, uh, and frequency and a couple other things. But you're measuring those two things. Um, and from there, you can figure out where your power usage is. You can see where the power is being used in your house. So it's, it's, it should give you more granular detail of how yeah. your house is using electricity. That's cool. And if I had, if I had a, like, let's say I had a table saw plugged into a circuit and I was wondering if it was getting a full amp draw or if there was a voltage drop or something in it, would, would that Wi-Fi, would that breaker be able to tell me that? Yeah, you could pull it up on the app and you could yeah. see how much power it's using at that moment in time. You could see the volts, you could see amps, you could see everything about it. And so you can also use it for diagnostic reasons, right? If something if something's not Absolutely. working right, yes, if it's something's not doing what it's supposed to, if the breaker is tripping, if, if that's the case. So, so from the ones you've seen, you can actually get that kind of real time data, like you get with the sense. You can see the voltage, the amperage in real time of, of what it's doing. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. It's and I, I, to your earlier point, though, I don't think it's resettable from uh, from the Wi-Fi. I, think, I would still think that's mechanical. Yeah. Yeah, that could get, that would get, I would think, get a little dangerous if you're like <laughs> on the beach and you're, and you're thinking, you're like, like and you just keep trying, oh, you know, there's like a squirrel chewing on the line or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Dave, thanks for writing in. I hope that, that uh, info is helpful. Um, Dan on Facebook is saying, I have a dimmer on four overhead LED lights. One of the overheads only illuminates seventy-five percent of the other three. How do I solve it? One of the overheads uh, illuminates it. So four LED lights. So it depends whether they were originally dedicated to LEDs or they were LED lamps that were installed after the fact. Um, okay. We found that usually when that happens, if it's a older dimmer, it's not an LED compatible dimmer, even though it still might function. Um, one of the ways a lot of times you can kind of cheat this to test it is in that system uh, you can actually throw an incandescent lamp in that puts an additional load on the system and see if it operates properly and if it does typically it's something with the more we've seen that it's been a dimmer that wasn't compatible yeah. it makes sense okay yeah, i would ask him too to see are all of the led bulbs the same right because right. you've got four lights if they're four different leds or three are the same and one's different uh, then they're going to have different, you know, different load ratings, right? And it's going to have a different response potentially. But I think he hit the nail on the head. It's probably that the dimmer switch itself is not LED compatible. And there's different styles of LED compatible dimmers too that I found. <laughs> yeah. The hard way. You know, there's you know, leading edge and trailing edge and all this other and tree axe and stuff like that. So it can get really complicated really quickly. But uh, you got to get the right dimmer switch. Absolutely. All right. Cool. Um, thanks, Dan. Hopefully that helps. Uh, let's see. We got um, Michael on Facebook. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Why is it important to not bond the neutral and ground together in a sub panel? So in a sub panel, at, at the main panel, they are bonded together. In a sub panel, they're separated because you want a completely isolated path for your ground. So they want them entirely separated at that point. So if something were to happen, that ground is entirely independent and gets it right back to the main point and back into the system. Okay, got it. Thanks, Michael. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, we got Jack on YouTube. I think this might be for you, Ross. New to uh, new to us with no geofencing. Uh, are there Bluetooth-based geofencing products that keep the the um, let's see that. 
keep the house and keep the dog in a, the pooch, keep the pooch in a designated area versus laying a circle of wire. So it sounds like they're asking if there's a way to create the invisible fence using geofencing for, a, for an animal. I think, I think I'm understanding that correctly. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if I know of a product that would give you that capability. Um, I'm sure that there are Bluetooth dog like collars yeah. that would be able to use Bluetooth, you know, or some other type of communication protocol to basically tell the approximate distance of the dog. I'm like, I'm just thinking out loud, like, could you, could you treat the dog as a homeowner, you know, a person within your family and have this collar, you know, basically connect to the Life 360 or a similar app type of account, you know, you might not get to the level of detail of 20 or 30 feet because you're only going to get 300 to 500 in an urban setting. But, um, so I don't know if geofencing would necessarily work for a dog per se, um, unless you had a really big yard. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, Jack, hopefully that's helpful. Thanks for writing, writing to us. Uh, Justin on YouTube, do you recommend Wi-Fi extenders to prevent smart home devices from dropping connection in different parts of a home? Yes. <laughs> I, I could tell you were going to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know if Heath wants to chime in here, but it's basically, if you don't have a good Wi-Fi network around your house, you're going to get drop call, I mean, dropped uh, signals. And uh, part yeah. of that is, is extenders to just take the same bandwidth and extend it over a larger area of coverage. The other option is to go to a mesh network, which uh, basically gives you, um, I think, even a far superior uh, Wi-Fi uh, signal across your house. So I'm with you on that one. And I'm not a big fan of extenders. I've never had a lot of luck. Uh, it seems like they'll always change the speed of what the original system is when it's trying to go to an extender. It'll slow it down a lot of times. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm definitely a big mesh network guy. And there are a few products that we use where it's nice and actually still hardwired. But if you struck with the house to have some cat six run through the place, it, mm -hmm. and it's repetitive on top of being a wireless mesh network, you still have the hardwired connection. So if something fails, it can always kind of back feed and go back to the system and still keep everything pretty solid. But definitely one of the most critical pieces when you ever start putting any of those systems in your house is you have to have a really, really strong and stable Wi-Fi network. That's the most critical part. That's step one. How does a mesh network differ from an extender? Like, what's the what's the difference between those two? So, on a mesh network, what you're effectively doing is um, you have multiple nodes of inputs and outputs. And so, think of a think of a you have your router, right? Your main Wi-Fi router in your house, and that's putting output, you know, sending out a signal, and then it's looking for devices to send, you know, basically grab that data and bring it back to the Wi-Fi router. Right? So it's, it's taking sending out outputs and inputs. It's receiving both. When you have a Wi-Fi extender, you're basically putting an access point far out in the system that basically is wirelessly communicating back and forth with that router. When you put in mesh networks, you basically have multiple access points that all act as outbound and inbound. And they all basically um, support each other. So it's, it's like having more Wi-Fi routers located around your house as opposed to just a single extender, right? So th right. There's a, it's a fundamental difference. And Mesh has a lot of other like small features, um, you know, multiple user input, multiple user output, um, beam forming. It has all this other cool technology that basically enhances the speed of, depending on the targeted device that you are using. Is it so? I have a I have an Orbi system, and I'm pretty sure I'm it's mesh. It's a yeah. yeah, that's what it's I mesh. Yeah, that's what I think. Next year, Orbi is one. Yep, yeah. it's awesome. I I love yeah. it. Um, it it's been and the cool thing about it too, I noticed is that like I moved the I moved the one it came with one of the what do you call it satellites. Yeah, one of the satellites, yeah. and my house is small enough that I only need. The, the main one and this other satellite. And I can actually, you know, I had it in one, you know, on the third floor of the house and then I needed access down in the basement, my shop. And I just brought that thing down here and it's like, it's perfect. It's just, yeah. the speed's amazing and yeah. it does everything. And I still get great, I still get better coverage up on the third floor than I expected. So yeah, the mesh network is, is that, that system. And, and the cool thing is it's, it's expandable. 
So if you wanted to cover your third floor better, you could add another one of those satellites paired with the system, and then you just you know strengthen the whole yeah. system that much better, and you've got much more coverage. Yeah, the more you add, the better it just gets at talking to itself. It really does a great job. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. We've got you know I'm streaming videos from our from our server, and there's a you know movie on Netflix being streamed, and then you know. A Peloton class going on and we're like all like there's no lag whatsoever and we're all in various parts of the house it's pretty it's pretty impressive so. I'll add mesh is definitely the way to go for most houses I think as well uh, but I'll add that you're still only as good as the the internet package from your yeah. provider yeah. So you have the best mesh network in the world you could have satellites all over the wazoo but if you only have a you know if you have a capped or limited data plan in terms of from your internet service provider um, then you're only going to get to that speed maximum, right? So some, in some cases, they might sell you a hundred gigabyte per second plan, a 300, or sorry, megabyte, 300, you know, 600, a gig, you know, so you have to pick and choose what your package is from the internet, from the ISP, from the internet service provider, whether it's Verizon, Comcast, Cox, Time Warner, blah, 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 blah. All right. Awesome. So Justin, there you go. Mesh network. That's your answer. Um, hopefully that helps. Um, Frank on Facebook. Thanks for joining, Frank. Uh, hi, Heath and Ross and Chris. Hey, Frank. My house has a new GFCI circuit breakers in the 1980s panel. Do these have a lifespan to be concerned about, or are they good as long as the test button works? That's, that's a question I'm wondering about. That's a great question. I, I wish there was a better way to test them, but it is the test button. Um, you know, they do want you to, they, there's usually a sticker that comes with them that says, test these once a month, make sure they operate. Um, you can do a plug-in wall tester. Uh, there are digital versions to see exactly what point it is tripping, uh, to see that it is tripping at the proper level that it should be. If it's not, you can certainly replace it. Um, but usually they pretty much work or they don't work. And those plug-in trippers you're talking about, it's like a, a three-pronged, basically, mail outlet. You put put in, you press a button, and that's, is that what you're talking about? That's the simple one to put in, just to see if it actually physically trips if you want to do that. But they actually make a digital one that'll tell you, and you can set a level or see the level that it actually is popping. So if you want to trip at five milliamps, which is the GFI should, um, you can see how close it is to tripping to that. Uh, if it starts climbing to 10, 20, 30, and it's not tripping, it's time to replace it. That's something typically a homeowner is not gonna wanna buy that tool and not really have a need for it. Um, but the quick and simple test is, you know, plug that device in, press the little trip button. If it trips, it's usually still pretty good. Okay, all right. Um, Frank, hopefully that helps. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've got time for a few more questions. Uh, Amy on Facebook, how many lights and switches can be on a 15 amp circuit? I want to add LED ceiling lighting when a new switch. We, we got, we talked about that a little bit on Monday, but, um, yeah. go ahead. it's, you really have to calculate the load. So the guide used to kind of be, we, for us anyway, and there'd be sketches in the handbooks that would say, you know, maybe do about 10 outlets, uh, 10 receptacles on a, um, on a 15 amp circuit, or we'd go to 10 lights just because you could max out at a 100 watt lamp, uh, and that would be the max to that load. You know, you may not be using that, but that's the potential of it. Now everything's LED. And so if you have stuff that's dedicated to LEDs, like the wafer lights that draw nothing, they draw six to 10 watts a piece. Um, you know, if you have central air, you know you're not gonna be plugging in a portable air conditioner or portable heater, there's not gonna be a load on that system at all. So. Taking a look at that is kind of what's going to determine what you can or can't add nowadays. Um, that being said, it's probably not a problem adding a single LED light. Again, there's not much of a draw there. Um, but if you're not sure, definitely consult someone. Okay. All right. You could put, you could put all your LED lights all on one 15 amp breaker and still be, if it's LED, not even close. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend that. I'm sure you said the same thing, but it's crazy. They don't draw that much power. Yeah. Now we did a commercial building that had that, you know, one story assisted living facility where I was looking at the print and the entire, the entire lighting package, all dedicated LED. So there's no chance of changing it unless you physically took a fixture out. Uh, but everything was dedicated LED. I forget, 30, 31, 32 fixtures in this particular group. And it just, when you look at it at first, after doing it for a while, you're like, no, it's way too much. It right. drew 0.4 amps. <laughs> all was said and done. I'm like, okay. Crazy. Yeah. 
All right, we got um, one more question here before we let you guys go. I know Ross, you got to work on your uh, your dunk game back. <laughs> um, Odney from Facebook uh, wants to know. Said, uh, and it sounds like this is a good one for you, Ross. Um, what are some good resources that I can consult in order to explore research? having a home generator installed, um, thinking about hurricane season and getting away from gasoline power generators. So I'm sure you both have some thoughts on that, but throw it out to you. So he's looking for a good resource to research generators? Yeah. yeah. I don't know, Heath, do you know of a good like online research? I mean, there's a, if you Google it, there's a, you know, be a bunch of resources that would yeah. pop up. Um, I mean, the two big ones for residential are obviously you can go to the two sites are Generac and Kohler. Mm -hmm. uh, both have good products and you can kind of look over there and see as far as sizing what makes sense for your application. But as far as a an unbiased one, I'm not really familiar with a particular one that would really spell some of that out for you. Yeah, I wonder if right. the reports cover uh, I'm sure that must but someone like that must. And, um, how would you... Um, Sorry, go ahead. Generac, for sure. Yeah. Then, how, how do you do those sites help you size what like this figure out what size you need, or is that something that like Keith you would provide if, if someone called you up and said I want to I want to have this generator installed? Would you be the one sizing it, or would they already kind of know before contacting you? It's it can go both ways. So if they have no idea, they just want to get a general idea. We can certainly go out there and see what they want to call it, what they don't, uh, and give an idea of what size. And it's it's also dependent. The other big thing is fuel how much fuel you have available may limit you as to what you can really put in as well. If you have natural gas line coming in, then it may not be an issue. If you have propane, you'd be amazed at how much propane you really have to store if you want to run a whole house generator. Uh, and that may not be an easy or affordable option. Um, but otherwise, a lot of the sites have, you know, essentially a calculator that you can say, I want to run my heat, my refrigerator, my air conditioning, if I really want to. With all these things, let me enter the number of the size breaker. Let me see how big this really is what's the minimum unit I need? So you can, some of those have a setup that you can actually take a look at and get a basic size from that. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks Rodney. Um, and thank you all for joining us again. Thank you, Ross and Heath. Um, I know you both have to get back to work and, uh, Ross, you got some, some game to work on. <laughs> I've been working my basketball game here. I know. I, I, as our master electrician, I I'm, I'm, I can uh, help but take notice of a of a of wood shop behind you. So um, yeah, cool. Yeah, a little bit of everything. I'm a little more dangerous with, with that. <laughs> yeah, when, when Ross, paint grade when, only. Paint grade only. <laughs> when Ross said you hit the nail on the head. I I, I was I, I bit my lip, but uh, <laughs> I haven't heard a lot of electricians hitting the nail squarely. On the head. Uh, <laughs> Not you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of the week. Have a good weekend. Uh, last chance to enter to win our Home Depot, a Home Depot uh, gift card. I think it's uh, 3 o'clock tomorrow. So uh, go to our website, thisoldhouse.com. Check that out. Uh, until then, I'm Chris Hermides. See you guys soon. See you guys. Be safe. Bye, everybody.